And welcome back. Uh, good afternoon on the east and central time zones. Still morning over in the west, but we're all joined together. I'm Andrew Bell, joining you from the central commentary position of the future drought forum, science to practice forum. And here we're going to be talking for the future drought fund about what is just over the next ridge, if you like, what's what, what we are planning for for the future, the emphasis on the future. And there's been a lot of emphasis in the build up to this on what we've been calling the hubs. Their formal name, and I have to make sure I get this right, is the Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hubs. In a word, they focus on collaboration, coming together, something that happens in rural and regional communities a lot, but coming together in a structured way and coming together not only in the individual hubs, but all the hubs coming together, sharing ideas, working through things that might work, should work, must work. And in the next hour and a half or so, we're going to take a trip to three of our hubs. There are eight all up. Now, as you might understand, things have changed a bit since the planning started for this event. Things have changed a bit since we tried to nail down our run order only about 24 hours ago because of what's happening with COVID. Indeed, in the last three hours since we started, the situation has changed in Queensland. So we appreciate that there are a lot of people all over the place who are having to keep half an eye on those news notifications, but keep one and a half eyes, please, on our forum for the next little while. We're going to start off our race around the country, or at least down the East Coast to three hubs with a visit to tropical North Queensland. Let's take a look. The Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub has been established as part of the federal government's uh, drought resilience program, one of eight hubs established around the country as part of the Future Drought Fund. Of the Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub, we're looking to work with end users, farmers, stakeholders from Rockhampton in the south all the way up to the Cape and out to Mount Isa in the west. We want to work with the end stakeholders to really increase their resilience to drought uh, and future drought. Drought can have a, a real range of impacts on social, emotional, um, and just the whole community in general is affected by droughts. It's really important that we support our primary producers with the skills and knowledge and tools to help them make really good decisions in a changing climate. Those primary producers are the backbones of those rural communities. The Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub will provide a connection between research institutions like the JCU Ideas Lab and our rural communities and our primary producers. So it'll be providing them with the research information in a really applicable way that they can apply on farm to help them make the best decisions to manage their land so that we can maintain healthy ecosystems for future generations. The Tropical North Queensland Hub hopes to share knowledge between the nodes around the regions in the activities that will create a more drought resilient future. The Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub will help our graziers and cane farmers make informed decisions which will help them in terms of future resilience. Importantly, that will help their profitability and it will also help them in terms of managing their land. Our node is uh, the Burdekin node. It's located here in Townsville but we'll be working very closely across with the other nodes of the Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub. The Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub is important and we've really gone for nodes to put people in the regions to work with the agricultural community and the communities and businesses in that area so they've got people they can go and talk to and we have people we can work through to make a difference on the ground in those geographic areas. The main hub of it is in the, the James Cook University Ideas Lab in Cairns which covers the wet tropics but we also have nodes and we'll have people and activities on the ground uh, from the southern gulf, the northern gulf uh, the Burdekin node covering the dry tropics, uh, Isaac and Sunday, and a node down in the Fitzroy around Rockhampton. A key part of the Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub is innovation. So we're looking at different and new ways that we can work with our uh, end stakeholders, our communities, to look at, well, what are some novel ways, something we maybe haven't thought of before, to increase the resilience to future drought activities. Gee whiz, it is, as they say, 
a big country. And now we're going to go live all the way to Cairns, where I'm reliably informed it's 36 degrees. We'll be doing a bit of weather updates during the next few, few days. And let's go up to the hub there at the JCU Ideas Lab. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, before we kick off, and, and most importantly, as you said, I, I, we do want to acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first inhabitants of the country and pay respect to the traditional owners and the elders past and present upon the land in which we stand here today. Um, the Japkarai, the Irangangi and the Goom Ayindi people. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd also like to acknowledge the valuable contribution that the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continue to make for us here at James Cook University, where we are today, but also to the broader community across which the tropical North Queensland drought hub covers. Uh, welcome to Cairns, everyone from, from all around the world. Um, it is uh, very warm up here. Um, we are, uh, I guess, very dynamic situations at the moment. So we've had some, some changes over the last uh, couple of hours as the, the COVID situation uh, is unfolding. So we've had a few changes to our presenters, but most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, up here in Cairns, we have a selection of over 30 of our uh, Tropical North Queensland Hub members, uh, network partners, stakeholders who have been able to join us here in Cairns today, which has been absolutely outstanding. And we were fortunate enough to have a, a essentially a launch event for the Tropical North Queensland Hub uh, breakfast event here this morning. So it's been really good to, to really, you know, officially kick off the Tropical North Queensland Hub and have that opportunity to, to meet, mingle, talk about, you know, what this is going to look like for the Tropical North Queensland Hub here this morning. Um, the aim of this presentation, we've got a few people that will step in and do different parts of this presentation, but we just wanted to give people, I guess, both here in the audience in Cairns, but obviously who are on the live stream, a bit of an insight into, you know, well, what do we think the Tropical North Queensland Hub look like uh, where we stand today? Uh, most importantly, as you said, it, it's really key, as you said, you know, these things are only achieved by the activities driven by people. And I said, we think we've got a, an exceptional team uh, as part of the Tropical North Queensland uh, Drought Hub. Um, to introduce myself, um, you would have got from the video, uh, Daniel Christie, uh, the Director of the Tropical North Queensland Hub. Uh, importantly, uh, Rachel Hay is an, a knowledge broker. Now, Rachel was going to present um, in some of the presentation today, but unfortunately, uh, Rachel is racing around uh, packing up hotel rooms because we, we need to make it back uh, to Townsville uh, this evening. Um, also, um, we've got five leaders of, I guess, what we have as our, our um, hub programs and, you know, the, 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 the real leaders of who are going to drive the activity through the hub. So I'll just sort of go around and, and introduce that. So we've got Yvette Everingham, who heads up our Transform Transformation Agricultural Systems. Um, Stuart Lockie, who are familiar to many people up here and, and around uh, the country, who's really looking after our coordination and outreach. Um, Harriet, uh, who is uh, the leading up the, the stream around building human capacity, which is obviously a, a really critical component of what we see this hub do. Uh, Luke Deacon, who you will hear from as part of this presentation, who really looks after the innovation and commercialisation uh, activities in the hub. And we see this as a, one of the real things, as I said, you, you heard you know, the keynote speakers talk around. You know, these hubs, you know, innovation and the opportunity for commercialisation are key activities within the hub. So this is what Luke heads up for us. And then we've got uh, Alan Dale, who's looking after sustain, uh, sustainable Indigenous enterprise. And we'll go into that in a little more detail of what that involves when we go through the hub presentation. So, as you said, Tropical North Queensland Hub, um, a bit like was indicated, it, it's, a, it's a large place. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult place. As you said, very, you know, I guess characterised by distinct monsoonal climate weather, as you said, you know, greater year on year variability than anywhere else in Australia. Uh, most interestingly, when the Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister were up here to, to announce the successful Tropical North Queensland Hub, I think we got 250 millimetres of rain uh, in that day in one sitting, which is always a little bit ironic. But as I said, this is really about future drought. And so that's really what we, we're focusing on here. Um, in the region that we, we cover, you know, exceptional biological and landscape diversity. 
And that really came through, as I said, we had a, a, a welcome to country by the traditional owners of the Yurungandji people here this morning as part of our hub launch. And one of the things they really went into was, you know, the tropical diversity, you know, that you do see across here. Everything from tro tropical savannas to wet tropical rainforests that we have uh, around the wet tropics. Um, and, and I guess, you know, extending on that, you know, we do have, you know, exceptional social and cultural diversity and significant lands under Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander management. Obviously, you know, this is why we're very important that this forms, you know, part of our tropical North Queensland hub activities. And I was going to um, wax lyrically at this point how we're remote from Australia's southern capitals and how that has served us well for COVID. And that was working really well till about three hours ago. Uh, and so not, not, not so much. But as you said, the reality is, is, you know, we are in a remote location, you know, from a less to the rest of the population here. Um, but we do see, you know, we are key up at this way uh, for trade and education, you know, in the Pacific and you know, across Southeast Asia. So we see that as our, our place uh, that we're, we're, we're looking after. So, as you said, these were the sort of things that we worked with our, our hub partners and, and stakeholders when we were putting together, you know, the Tropical North Queensland uh, hub bid. You know, what what do we want to see at the end of this? And I said, and that's always, I think, a really important point is, you know, we, we've got a view of well, what do we want to achieve in this um, and how are we going to get there is the bit that we're trying to put together now. But, you know, the goal of this hub is, they said, we, we see this as an activity we want to go on to well in the future past what is the current, I guess, vision of the, the drought hubs nationally. And they said, this is an important piece of work for this region that this is really the, the initiating piece that we're trying to do. But our goals are really, you know, we want a region that's characterised, you know, by an innovative and profitable agriculture sector. You know, agriculture is one of the key economic pillars for Northern Australia and particularly up here in northern part of Queensland. So we see that as an absolute, you know, key component to make sure this is a successful industry for the communities of this region. You know, we'd like our, our agriculture community to be recognised for quality, safety and responsibility. That's a key component. You know, recognised for leadership in climate resilience, as you said, and sustainable development, you know, for what we see is the global tropics. Um, our hub, you know, we're very big, and we'll go into this in a little bit in the co-design, you know, must take a whole of systems approach that is framed by, you know, the challenges and opportunities that are unique to the region of which we're covered. Um, just to quickly go into it, a bit like uh, I, some of the other hubs that you'll hear from over the next couple of days, you know, we are operating a, a hub and spoke model. And as we're very fortunate to have a, a bunch of the node um, key people in the room with up here uh, with us in Cairns today. But as you said, you know, the Tropical North Queensland hub is, is hubbed out of the, the, the JCU Ideas Lab here in, here in Cairns and really looking after, as you said, the, the node area around the wet tropics. Um, we do have a, a tropical north node, um, essentially, you know, uh, covers the northern Gulf. Um, we will have a, a Gulf on Carpentaria node, which sort of takes in that, that southern Gulf region. Um, we do then extend all the way down to the Fitzroy around Rockhampton, where we'll have a node working back up the coast to uh, Mackay, uh, Mackay and Whit Sunday node and into the Burdekin node, who was part of that um, quick introductory video that you saw. Now, a key component of this is, as I said, we're going to have people on the ground in these locations and other locations because we see that working with the end users, the stakeholders in the community is vitally important as part of that. As you said, we won't go into the slide. So we're very fortunate to have, you know, a group of these hub members and, and network partners, as you said. But, you know, initially when we kick off the hub, as you said, we have, we have 12 initial uh, hub members are part of the Tropical North Queensland hub and over 50 network partners at this point. But as I said, we, we see that this will grow and this is really where we're starting off. But as I said, this is a, a really key part of what we see will be success to the hub is how we work with our hub members and our network partners and stakeholders across our geographic area. A quick, we'll go into co-design uh, in a little bit, but just want to sort of, you know, co-design is sort of even how we put together a proposal. Here's, so here's three questions we asked uh, in a series of workshops we ran as we were putting together the, the Tropical North Queensland Drought Hub proposal. You know, what do you think drought resilience looks like in Tropical North Queensland? Here's just, you know, some of the word, I guess, pictures that sort of came up, that the sort of things that we, we got back. So, as you said, we, we wanted to start with co-design and working with these people and having input, and it said, we plan to build on this as the hub activities expand. 
Uh, we also asked, you know, what are the expected benefits for the tropical North Queensland region uh, around, you know, being part of a, the drought hub um, initiative? And again, you can see some of the, the things that were there. Sustainable resilience, you know, communities came through very important around what we did. And what do you think is the value proposition of the tropical North Queensland drought hub? As you said, you can so again see, you know, some of the things that came through, but these are all things that we'll build on through the co-design process will flow through the tropical North Queensland drought hub. But again, sharing people knowledge, as you said, are, are all very key components of that. Um, we have, as I said, the overall, so you saw who the, the leaders of these different streams were, and we sort of have, these are the, the streams that run through the um, program logic that runs through the, the drought hub. You know, transform all agricultural systems, you know, focus on building an enduring program looking towards the future. Innovation and commercialisation, I'll hand over to Luke to go into that. Building human capacity is one of those fundamental pillars, as I said, without the people and without their ability to do what we do, we can't achieve what we want to. A sustainable Indigenous enterprise and coordination and outreach. A few key things, as I said, you know, co-design is a key piece, but we've got a, a few themes running through the tropical North Queensland drought hub that we see is important for our region. Uh, Yvette Everingham was going to speak to these slides, but as I said, is things are changing and we're, we're, we're madly running around and so a bit dynamic. But, you know, really the things that Yvette is going to be looking at is, you know, drought resilience mapping and optimisation. So an activity around understanding, well, what do people use now in our region, you know, to, to inform, uh, prepare and what activities they do around drought. Um, we do see ag tech and, and as, a, as a key component of that. So what are the enabling technologies for trans for uh, transformational drought solutions. And another interesting one that we, we were fortunate to talk through a number of our hub partners and, and network partners is really, well, what, what part does finance and how does you know finance and resilience to drought link? And we see this as a really com key component. I am gonna hand over now to, to Luke Deacon, who's our, our stream leader for the innovation and commercialization. Thanks, Luke. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so the innovation and commercialisation stream will really build on the work of the, the transformational agricultural systems piece that uh, Yvette is leading. Um, so the vision around this piece of work is really to create intellectual property um, up in the north um, and look at building technology and technical services around drought resilience uh, and agriculture. So this program of work will really support the establishment and growth of drought resilience and um, uh, and ag tech focused enterprises servicing um, regional, national and international markets. Um, so what we're trying to do is really develop an innovation and commercialization pipeline. So we're going to build on the through the co-creation um, engagement and assessment work through the co-design process. What we'll be really looking to do is to shake out some of the key challenges that we're looking to solve and tackle to help improve drought resilience. Um, so what we'll then be doing is trying to support um, the creation of, uh, of projects and ventures that have high potential for commercial impact uh, in tackling some of the challenges that we're trying to, to um, achieve. Um, and we'll establish programs for technology um, and venture development, so both in the JCU Ideas Lab, but also out in farm in situ as well. Um, and really what we're going to try and do is create the mechanism to take those early stage ideas, businesses and indeed startups and help them be successful. So um, we've got a state of the art facility here at the JCU Ideas Lab and we've indeed got some existing infrastructure that we're going to leverage to try and help support some of these, um, these early stage ideas and businesses to scale. Um, yeah, so we, we also have a, um, a commercialisation fund here at JCU called the Sand to Seed Program which is really there to take early, promising early stage research uh, and provide some growth capital to help prototype. Um, we have an entrepreneur in residence who's focused on ag tech, um, who will be using to, uh, to help support uh, with some of these early stage uh, opportunities. Um, and we're keen to explore uh, through the co-design process, proving out um, return on investment, testing innovative technology solutions um, at scale. So that's one of the programs of work we're, we're keen to take on. Um, we're also keen to partner on this journey, um, and one of the things we're interested in exploring is really the intra-hub opportunities, uh, and potentially using the hubs as a vehicle for market entry to test out some of the ideas we're working on, not just in the in uh, tropical North Queensland, but also into the other hubs as well. Um, 
yeah, so, so really extending out this testbed concept. Um, and indeed, we're keen to create global pathways for some of these ideas to give them the oxygen they need to not just help uh, tropical in tropical North Queensland, but nationally and also into export and growth markets to help um, a, a achieve a real step change. So that's probably enough from me. So thanks, Dan. I'll hand over to Harriet. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's hard to listen to talks after lunch. Um, I am going to be talking to you about the Building Human Capacity uh, Program. Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful uh, weapon which you can use to maximise change and bring about change. And it is in that vein that we are using the Building Human Capacity uh, Program. It's about building and maximising individual community, uh, business resilience and adaptive capacity through looking at workforce development, through looking at um, next generation of skilled workers for agriculture and rural industries, through building entrepreneurship, skills for collaborative networks across um, the trainers and education providers, also looking at the credentialing system and recognition of lifelong learning and different ways we can accredit those, uh, building capacity for innovation, building the next generation of researchers and understanding uh, of research and capacity to use evidence and research because that's becoming far more critical in productivity and profitability, looking at higher degree students and we're working in with Luke around commercialisation of the research and addressing of the research. Uh, I won't go through, uh, we've got lots of aims and objectives, that time is short, so I'll just cut it short by just giving you a little bit of a taster of each of these areas. So work skills and credentialing is about upskilled workers, school leavers, those who are changing careers, retraining of workers and accreditation. Some of the range of activities that we're envisaging include identifying and mapping skills need in the within the hub regions, mapping options and addressing gaps in learning, accreditation, working with providers to tailor specific programs to learning needs and pursuing credentialing and micro-credentialing options. Research and training is about the R&D workforce. How could we look at developing capacities of researchers and also what's the gaps in research in our region? So this is about a network of higher degree students around effective supervision, about industry links with research, postdoctoral opportunities and fellowships, bursaries and travel. The industry internship is about learning through doing, work integrated learning, and opportunities for students to get employment in the rural industries process. And the last one is about innovation and outreach. It's about uh, looking at how do we participate, uh, uh, how do we build skills for innovation and also commercialization of that innovation. And we're envisaging, again, a range of activities such as hackathons, collaborative design, and so forth. So the human dimension capacity is uh, pretty critical for drought resilience and adaptability. The next one I'm going to briefly talk about is the Sustainable Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Enterprise. Professor Alan Dale will lead this. He apologises that he can't be here to talk to you about this. Um, tropical North Queensland is Indigenous landscape, as Dan showed you. And of course, one of our partners is TICA, which is the Tropical Indigenous Councils Alliance. There are uh, 13 local government areas, particularly Indigenous councils, that are partners of the hub. Um, this uh, hub is going to focus on transformational agricultural systems, innovation and commercialisation and human capacity building, particularly things around cultural knowledge, different knowledge systems, um, looking at challenges and smart technologies that uh, our traditional uh, indigenous communities can use, looking at uh, employment and training options, credentialing options and building human capacity. Um, this is not as developed. We are believing that we're going to do this jointly with our uh, indigenous communities in a co-design manner. We're very much looking forward to this being indigenous led and indigenous developed. So in that sense, that's why it's less developed and we look forward to that collaboration. I'll hand you back to Dan.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Luke and uh, Hurry. As you said, the, the last thing I just want to touch on, and I said, and realise that uh, we're, we're, we're running close to time, as you said, is the last, uh, I guess, stream that runs through the hub is, is coordination outreach, which uh, Professor Stuart Lockie will head up. Obviously, you know, lots of activity in this space of a lot of people aware, as you said. So we see coordination outreach is fundamental to how the hub is going to operate. So obviously it feeds directly into the co-design uh, processes. You know, cross-sectoral coordination, as you said, across the activities, across different sectors, across different uh, levels of government. The most important, I think, is around communication, as you said. So, you know, how communication works within our hubs and obviously across all the hubs and activities across the country is a critical part and Stuart will be the lead of that. And uh, importantly, monitoring and evaluation and learning. We, we've got to make sure what we're doing is actually achieving the outcomes we hoped. And if it's not, well, what do we need to change and where do we need to move? The last thing I just want to touch on quickly, as you said, and it's really, as you said, we, we've discussed this with our, our hub members up here at the Tropical Northlands Hub and Network Partners. We see the co-design process is absolutely critical. And we will be out actually, you know, in working with our hub members and network partners in the near future, talking to them around, you know, how is this best facilitated in the areas that, that they're responsible and have, you know, influence and knowledge on and what's going to be worth that. And we see that there's going to be some common things across that, that but there's also going to be things that are actually relevant really for that geographical area and the activities relevant to that area. So we want to work with our partners who have deep knowledge and relationships in there as we put together the hub activities moving forward. And I think that uh, brings the time. I just want to last, I just want to finish on before we head into questions, is thank you very much for all our uh, hub partners and, and network partners who were able to join us here today for the, the launch of the Tropical North Queensland Hub. And thank you, obviously, uh, as part of this forum, uh, being able to present uh, what we plan to do and hopefully it was of some use to the, the people on the, the broader national forum. And really looking forward to hearing from the other hubs over the next few days and uh, the other presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan, Thank you. and your team. You got breakfast. I barely got a cup of coffee here this morning, but well done. And it sounds like you, you've actually got people in the room. Congratulations and well done for wrangling what was a pretty uh, interesting landscape with COVID this morning in Queensland. We've got time for Q&As. Don't forget, you can use the Q&A box to send us your questions. One from me, you talked about hub and spoke. Now, you've got a huge area to cover there, but is... Uh, uh, is embracing the fact that no, and I use the word advisedly, arbitrary region is homogeneous. It's not all the same thing. But one of the keys here is to know that there isn't one size fits all, even in the individual hub, never mind the whole of the country. Oh, and, and definitely, and, and that's what we sort of see. And, you know, that's what we see our hub members as really key to that, because as you said, you know, in the, the geographic area that the, the Tropical North Queensland hub things is, you know, the approaches even in similar, you know, agricultural systems can still be very different. Um, you know, what happens in, in, you know, you know, sugarcane farming up here in the north is different to the south. How the cattle work, how all the different agricultural systems work is very different across the geography and I guess the, the land area we're at. And this is why we, you know, we see that working with the, the hub members and the key people in those regions are around what's going to work for how the business and communities operating in that area is going to be absolutely critical uh, in the success of the activities of this hub. But we also think that there might be some things that go that do go across that geographic area that's you know common that we can really you know um, work together across, and that we, we think will extend across the country. So that's the sort of things we're we're looking forward to working through uh, as part of our co-design process. Yeah, it's all about being present and engaged. Now, a uh, question that's come in from um, John Reeves. How is the uh, James Cook University Hub going to ensure relevant innovations are pushed into the Timor-Leste, PNG, Pacific region? Because you're in a, a unique spot there, aren't you? Because you're geographically more connected with other countries than I think off the top of my geographic head, any other place in in the country. So uh, uh, is that part of your thinking, to, to, to innovation being pushed beyond Australia's shoreline? Oh, I, I think that's always been, been part of the DNA of how we operate up here. So, so you, you know, while it might, you know, become in the, the exact purview of, of the tropical North Queensland hub is, you know, when we go through these co-design activities and just through the, 
the network partners we work with, you know, the other people we work with, we do see, you know, if we develop things here that can help our, you know, Pacific neighbours, our friends, you know, to the north and into through Asia, well, then generally that's the, the nature of, of what we try and do. And particularly here at JCU, as you said, we've got very deep relationships across the Pacific into PNG and Asia. And as you said, you know, part of that commercialisation that, that, that Luke runs is, as I said, really, well, how do what we do, you know, feed into those sort of opportunities that they see? So, so absolutely, as I said, it probably won't sort of come into the co-design, but when things get identified and through other conversations, most definitely. I've got, a, I've got another question here that's an, another anonymous question. Don't forget to put your name on the questions, please, and where you're uh, typing from. Um, having so many partners, a blessing, also a bit of a challenge. How do you plan or actually do manage so many moving parts? Because you all got to be on in, in the same direction for, for optimal outcomes. I, I see it as, a, as a, a real opportunity. As you said, in, when you're talking about the geographic area and the range of activities that, uh, that go across that geographic area, you need a lot of partners to work with to, to really identify. And I think we've been very open, as you said. The, the one thing that we do recognise is we can't do everything for everyone, as you said, and that's really part of the co-design process of, you know, making triage decisions up up early of what we can and can't do, but being open, honest and transparent about that with our network partners of the things we can do, we can achieve and the things that we can't, but maybe helping steer people in, in the right direction. So, you know, that communication and coordination are absolute key parts of that. So I'm going to actually say, well, Professor Stuart Lockie probably has the, the toughest job in the hub, but I think he's up to it. Thanks, Dan. I think that so far is the quote of the day. Triage decisions of what we can and can't do. I think every single person involved in this forum today has had to triage something or other with the, the challenges we've been brought. But thank you and your colleagues and the whole room up there in Cairns. Thank you for kicking off our hubs in focus. And uh, we'll be hearing from you again, I believe, during the next couple of days. But thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. One hub down, seven to go. Um, you may have noticed during the uh, presentation there from uh, Tropical North Queensland, a couple of comments popping up on the screen. They've been gleaned from our comments box. Uh, there's a lot of chat going on there. All of it will be recorded as giving the department and the uh, FDF team a sense of what people are thinking, how they're reacting to the presentations they are seeing and hearing. Right then, we're going to stay in Queensland and venture ever so slightly into Blues Territory over the border because we're now going to the Southern Queensland Northern New South Wales Hub or the SQNNSW as we so beautifully call it. And uh, let's go to the Toowoomba Hub and uh, to Anne uh, Staras, who should be waiting for us there to talk to us. Hello there, Anne. How are you? How's your day been in Toowoomba? It's been a bit of a day. Hello, Andrew. I'm well, thank you. Uh, my day is actually in Brisbane because uh, I live in ah. Brisbane. And speaking of triage decisions, uh, yesterday our hub had to make the decision to cancel our lovely event we had planned and our launch. Uh, because of what's happening in Queensland with COVID and, and now we're going into lockdown. So uh, some of us who live in, in Brisbane are actually getting ready for that. So, But it's all working wonderfully and it's great to be here with you. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone, and great to be here to, to share with you what is an exciting initiative for us at USQ. And before we do that, I've... I've got to triage something immediately at this end because before we hear from you directly, we've got to show our audience this. The University of Southern Queensland leads the Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales National Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub. These national hubs are a flagship of the Australian Government's multi-billion dollar future drought fund. 
Now, this region in Australia has some of the highest levels of year-to-year -year climate variability and rainfall variability on Earth. We swing from extreme drought to extreme floods and then back again to extreme drought and we always get caught out. We have the knowledge in climate and drought science from the University of Southern Queensland and from around the world. And we can use that information to fit into our regional management decisions regarding drought and drought preparedness in Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales. We have a regional focus, but with world-renowned expertise in drought and resilience, and we connect with the world's leading drought preparedness centres and research centres throughout the globe. We can't just sit behind our desks and do good work. We have to get out and start talking to our regional communities, to agricultural industries, to our First Nations groups. We have to actually connect our long history of research and development with decisions that are made in the real world. We're standing on the banks of the Boulogne River and appearances can be deceiving. It's lovely and green here. But we've got water as you can see. However, if we didn't have a dam just up the road and a weir down here, that'd be dry. So the drought for us has been uh, and continues to be very pervasive and impacting on a lot of areas of our community. There's some 65% probably of our shire that hasn't received any or very little rain and in some areas they're still hand feeding. So whilst in some parts it's great, in other parts it's still very, very much 100% drought and still impacting very heavily on their way of life. So anything that we can do through the hub and through the council and through the government to help our communities become better prepared and more sustainable, then it can only be a good thing. Blintyre is a wonderful collection of seven communities and uh, they're all interconnected and related. We have a wonderful collection of resilient people in the Shire that are mostly farmers, you know, primary producers, contracting businesses, and then, the, you know, people in town that support the agricultural sector. It's been a really interesting eight years in the Shire. We've been drought declared. People have been um, very challenged, I think, through part of it, particularly through the 2019 period when the drought was extremely tough, when most of the district had less than 100 mils of rainfall. So the opportunity for the Drought Hub to come forward and, and to work with farmers and primary producers to be more resilient and adaptive in new technology is always great. I think farmers can always appreciate being supported and learning from each other. The Southern Queensland Northern New South Wales Adoption and Innovation Hub will help our regions become more prepared for and resilient to the impacts of drought. Our hub will operate in a region from Longreach in Queensland in the north to Dubbo in New South Wales in the south and from the east coast to the South Australian and Northern Territory borders. This covers an area of 1.7 million square kilometres. Our nodes will be located in Longreach, Roma and Stanthorpe in Queensland and Lismore, Armidale and Narrabri in New South Wales where our people will be working with farmers to understand their needs and drive future research. Because we are so heavily focused and dependent on agriculture, the more successful our agricultural businesses are, those benefits then flow on to the broader community. And once we start seeing that, then that means our, our you know, townships and our small businesses, supermarkets, you know, hotels, restaurants, etc., all get to survive. Um, whereas if if we can't become sustainable in the agricultural sector, then sadly the communities will die. The Federal Minister, Mr Littleproud, knows intimately these areas. He used to actually live in St George many years ago, so he understands the bush. And we think that if Mr Littleproud is behind this, he's got the best intentions and he will make sure it works for all communities. And we look forward to working with the hub to deliver for our community on the ground. The hub will give our farmers and communities the tools and skills to address the changing climate and to continue to produce the world's best food and fibre. We will work with and support our networks of right holders, stakeholders, including First Nations peoples, primary producers, growing community groups and industries to be more profitable, productive, adaptable and resilient to drought. The University of Southern Queensland is well known globally for our leadership in drought and resilience. And this initiative is building on that expertise. People can always adapt and move forward, so I think we need to be constantly learning. Um, you know, droughts are part of the Australian landscape, and every drought teaches us lessons that we can learn to prepare and do better for the next drought that's coming. So I agree, there's no better time than now to plan for what's ahead of us.
And that is a splendid introduction for us to go back to Brisbane to hear from Anne, who featured also in that film. Another very diverse region with their, its own set of circumstances and challenges. And what is your hub getting to grips with and how you're doing things? Lovely. Thank you, Andrew. And it's, as I said before, it's great to be here. Um, so the Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub, it's led by USQ and it's funded by the Future Drought Fund. And um, today I'm speaking on behalf of Professor Roger Stone, our Hub Director who can't be with us today. And uh, my name's Anne Starris and I'm the Knowledge Broker. I'm also speaking on behalf of the range of staff who've led this initiative uh, to where we are today. USQ would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and we'd like to pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. So University of Southern Queensland uh, is pretty pleased to lead this important initiative and we're working with some wonderful partner organisations to establish it across Southern Queensland and Northern New South Wales. Most of you uh, know Professor Roger Stone and luckily he's on a video there that you've got to see him before. Um, Roger's got a lot of experience working in climate science and applications for drought preparedness, uh, both in Australia and globally. Um, he has worked uh, in the Bureau of Meteor Meteorology and Queensland Government and USQ uh, as a director for the Centre for, Climate, uh, Clim Center for Applied Climate Sciences. Um, he's also held leadership positions with the United Nations um, World Meteorological Organization. So we're, we're wrapped to have Roger as our director. Um, I also have a range of experience, not, nothing like Roger's experience, but um, I worked in um, agricultural extension and communications and community engagement at a number of levels, local, state, national and international projects. So. I'm wrapped also to be here and to work with Roger and the team and our node managers uh, for the betterment of the entire community here. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of other staff who've been working pretty hard already also. Uh, Mr Chad Renando, who you'll probably see his name on the chat on the side of your screen, and um, Miss Liz Neary, who's been our acting hub manager and got us this far to date. Um, we've been finalising recruitment lately, so um, stand by and we'll have some node managers in place. Uh, so that's pretty exciting for us too. So we have a range of partners um, or hub members, as we're calling them. Um, we've got, I'm going to list some of them out because they've played a key role in helping get this, um, get us going initially. Uh, Southern Cross University, University of Newcastle, University of New England, uh, TAFE Queensland, uh, Central Western Queensland Remote Area Planning and Development Board and the Queensland College of Wine Tourism. We've got government departments in Queensland Department of Ag and Fisheries and Primary Industries and Local Land Services in New South Wales, uh, Southern Queensland Landscapes, Southern Gulf NRM, Healthy Land and Water and Land Care and uh, RDCs, we're working with Sugar Research Australia and the Australian Meat Processing Corporation, and business consultants and insurers, um, Agri Commodities, Willis Tower Watson, and the Agri Business Development Institute. So heading over onto our issues, um, Obviously, it's early days because uh, with the co-design process, we're going to be working with communities to identify the issues that are important to them. But um, from our perspective initially in our, in our planning, uh, obviously, we have a range of industries, uh, range of locations, range of climates throughout our region, uh, from beef sheep grazing in the northwest and the west of our area and across the region. We have um, uh, grains and cotton, in, uh, across the region, dry land and irrigated, and horticulture dotted throughout the region. Um, Stanthorpe is one of our nodes. So we have, you know, apples, uh, viticulture, uh, strawberries, and uh, also in Lismore area, there's tree fruits and horticulture. We've got up the coast as well. So dotted throughout the region is horticulture. So 
we have quite a challenge to uh, manage dealing with all of these industries, all of their needs. Uh, but the one thing in common is we're all facing um, the issue of being more prepared for working it with drought and with less water. Um, also, our hub uh, would like to acknowledge that um, drought impacts not just primary production, but has, has, has had a significant flow on effect across value chains and supply chains, including transport, processing industries and marketing, etc. And to this end, we want to include uh, the supply and value chain industries um, in our planning uh, and in our future initiatives. So um, we have a fairly high year-to-year uh, -year rainfall variability in Australia compared to other, other countries. And we have that in our region as well, um, as you can well imagine. So um, just across the region, we have uh, most of our Queensland part of our hub area is in drought still. And, uh, and then we have areas where recovering and, and uh, a little bit better off than recovering um, uh, in other areas as well. So uh, I think Queensland generally, there's about 65% of the area still in drought. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a significant issue that, that we're still dealing with here, the variability. Um, in terms of helping industries and, and businesses move forward uh, in between drought and also survive, continue to survive drought because it takes a long time to recover, especially when you're dealing with um, livestock, livestock businesses. Uh, some of our farming businesses have had um, crops only three years in the last nine and some of our businesses have been in drought for nine years. So um, it's a uh, it's quite a variability there. Lastly, um, in terms of regional and economic issues, um, we, the Hub would like to identify opportunities to grow local and regional economies and help to enhance community wellbeing as well as regional employment opportunities and incorporate local and Indigenous knowledges of drought within educational initiatives. Basically, we want to see local industries and businesses move forward and innovate. And we want to contribute to strong, resilient communities. In terms of our key activities, um, I've just got to find my notes here. Over the next couple of months, two to three months, we'll be undertaking community engagement um, with our communities and planning. So that's going to involve quite a little bit and that will be led through each of our nodes. Um, uh, that will involve interviews. We're currently doing interviews with our node managers and um, mapping out in each node region um, who's who. Uh, mapping out industries, organisations, community groups, stakeholders and issues and communication channels. And this is being led by Mr Chad Renando also on the chat. Um, also, we'll be holding workshops and through all this, we'll be mapping out, um, identifying and mapping regional co um, community and economic issues and, uh, and doing some mapping of the ecosystem. The outcome of this will be to develop um, regional plans for each node region, which will then be uh, talking, working with communities in an ongoing manner to fine tune those plans um, as we go forward. Other activities we're undertaking over the next few months, um, as well as the strategic planning, will be based on that, we'll be developing and fine-tuning operational plans. And, and from this, in relation to each node region, we'll be building our monitoring, evaluation and learning framework and plans. We'll be establishing communication adoption extension planning and engaging with First Nations to identify key issues and building cultural awareness. Um, our activities also include developing over the course of the life of the um, Hub Initiative project, um, place-based drought tools, toolkits, and wellbeing and employability toolkits, as well as establishing a legacy of co-innovation networks throughout the region. 
The idea of the co-design process for us is that local communities will be identifying relevant issues and then developing place-based solutions for those issues and future initiatives. So in terms of our linkages, um, USQ partners with Queensland Government now in the Drought and Climate Adaptation Pro Program and in its Northern Australian Climate Program. Key activities for the hub will be working with those programs and positioning our initiatives in line with these and with those of the Rural Economy Centre of Excellence, as well as our hub member and hub partner programs. So let's have a quick look around the region. Um, our, our hub is headquartered in Toowoomba at USQ and we have six nodes uh, that are being established throughout the region. You can see there on the graphic, Armidale, Lismore, Stanthorpe, Narrabri, Longreach and Roma. So our Lismore node um, is led by Southern Cross University and it will focus on sugarcane, tree crops and beef industries in northern New South Wales and southern Queensland. Our Stanthorpe node is led by the Queensland College of Wine Tourism and it will have a focus on horticulture, viticulture and grazing in southern Queensland. Our Narrabri node is led by New South Wales DPI and will have a focus on cotton, broadacre, grains and the grazing regions of northern New South Wales. Our Longreach node will be led by Central West Queensland Remote Area Planning and Development Board and it will have a focus on the semi-arid grazing regions of Western Queensland. Our Roma node is led by Southern Queensland Landscapes and it will focus on grain and grazing across Southern and Western Queensland. Our dedicated Armidale node is led by the University of New England and it will focus on livestock and broadacre cropping industries and their supply chains and communities. So that's it in a nutshell from us. Um, you can make contact with us at any time and, um, and we look forward to people making contact with us, research organisations, communities, um, uh, via our email address there. And I'd just like to say thank you to our partners who are uh, come on the journey with us on this initiative and thank you to the department um, for organising and hosting this forum. We look forward to working with the department, with our other hubs and with our member organisations on this important initiative. Thank you. And thank you, And But there's more. We've got a Q&A session to, uh, to address now. Can I start from here? Community well-being, that's a really interesting thing because it's something very often you can't KPI, you can't give it a number, but it's something we feel. And I know from personal experience, the cinema in Gundawindi, without support from the local council, that beautiful cinema with two screens would not be there and it just gives something to the, to the town. Um, can you speak a bit more about community well-being? Is it essentially the vibe or is it a, a, a sign of the strength of your node and your hub that people will bring knowledge and feelings into the room which will help shape policy, shape suggestions, shape recommendations? Thanks Andrew. I think there's a lot of um, aspects to community well-being and I'm by no um, I mean, an expert in that, but um, we see communities as the key to um, this initiative and community well-being, community ability to make decisions, communities seeing uh, a positive future are very important. And um, we think social interaction is very important in communities. Um, I think Roger and I have worked for many years with um, within Queensland um, country areas and, and we know what's happened, the decline in so the social fabric to an extent. So um, we've got that in the back of our mind as well, uh, working with our nodes, working with other organisations to work closely with the smaller the smaller um, districts 
to help um, somehow bring opportunity for people to get together and talk about experiences, to, to share ideas and build a collective. Um, because one of our initiatives is to establish a, a network of co-innovation throughout our region. So, and that's going to have to start with a positive community wellbeing and, and social activities. Yeah, you you mentioned the R word a bit, resilience, which we're going to hear a lot about, and the different natures of, of resilience. Christine Augie uh, from Canberra is asking a question here, and don't forget you can ask questions in the Q and A box. She's asking, thinking about communities you've worked with, are there common features of communities showing resilience? Are there some themes that come from all those nodes into the hub in your experience so far? Um, I think from the people I've talked to as well, I think the common features are possibly having some key people in the in the local area who are who are drivers uh, and who think about the needs of the local area, having organisations that work together uh, for the better of the local area, and certainly our communities have have, have done that over the last nine years of drought. Um, so I think I think they're important things, but I think that um, key leaders is uh, is an important one, and also our nodes and having having some scope to facilitate local communities to see the way forward is an important one. And a crucial part of community are obviously the indigenous communities within the broader community. Uh, can you tell us more? A question that's come in from one of our attendees. Um, who've uh, not put their name on it, don't forget, put your name on it if you're asking a question. We'd love to know who you are and where you're questioning us from. Can you elaborate more on your engagement with, in this case, Aboriginal knowledge holders? It's not, it, it's actually bringing knowledge, a deep-seated knowledge to the table and how that can inform the broader response to the challenge of drought. I think um, our activities, um, our engagement with First Nations will be led by our First Nations officer, but we're very excited to have this aspect to the project. Uh, long, long experience with drought and um, we would like to help facilitate Indigenous communities um, in relation to their own needs for managing drought and for sharing drought, response, drought responses and their knowledge within their communities, beyond their communities, um, so in that regard, we're hoping to have significant input into our strategic plan. It's early days, um, but from our, uh, I think it's 28 First Nations groups. Um, so basically, we'd like to build Indigenous capacity or help um, uh, to share knowledge um, within communities and to also build, build cultural awareness for us all around drought and management. And, of course, storytelling, such an intrinsic part of Indigenous culture, bringing that to the table. Another question here from Narell Hill, who's asking, you talk about place-based solutions. How do you plan on adapting or finding solutions to fit place? It's the sort of square peg in square hole question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's sort of my role. Uh, Obviously, issues are grounded um, uh, in our communities in terms of climate, in terms in terms of soil, in terms of all the various um, factors that lead to healthy communities and healthy businesses, and they're very specific. And I think that um, so the issues will be specific and seen as specific by individual businesses and individual communities. So I think the solutions have to have to emerge from that space. And uh, we will we will help to facilitate that um, through working working with our extension officers, and um, also bringing in uh, people to help communities work through their issues. So obviously providing information, but also that experiential learning and that ability to share share experiences, share perceptions, and basically to go on a journey together to uh, look at innovating and finding solutions. Uh, we've got a question here from Cameron Johns here. How do we balance co-design? And here's a, a phrase we're hearing a lot of already, and we're going to hear more about it in the coming hours and days. How do we balance co-design and giving people what they want or what they can see against solutions to the large problem of living with drought that sit outside a collective viewpoint? 
How do we do that? How do we get that balance right? Um, well, I think that's that's a real challenge because um, some people are, you know, it is difficult to see beyond the current situation. So I think um, I think we have to share experiences, share case studies uh, across across regions, across industries, and um, help build uh, build a strategy that uh, maybe a general strategy for a community, but then individuals. Uh, work with their own um, experts to help develop their own um, solutions. Um, obviously, we can't bring everyone on the journey, but all we can do is uh, offer the best that is available through our funding, through our staff, um, offer opportunities. Um, but yeah, there's a fair bit to be done in terms of helping businesses uh, prepare for drought in this space. And you're part of that work in uh, southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. And thank you so much speaking to us from Brisbane because things have been happening. You're probably well aware of them, which have somewhat disrupted us, but we are still upright and going to our hubs. Thank you so much for representing the work so far of that southern Queensland, northern New South Wales hub. And to you and your colleagues, thank you very much for that presentation and enjoy the rest of this forum. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Anne. Well, two hubs down. We've got one more to go today, five more over the coming days. Southern New South Wales is where we're going to go to next. It's not that far away from where I'm sitting here in Canberra as part of the Future Drought Fund Science to Practice Forum. So let's take a look at the work that's being done by that Southern New South Wales hub. Now is the time for primary producers, rural and regional communities to prepare for an increased resilience to future drought. Charles Sturt and its partners in the southern New South Wales region are ready to do this together as they form the Future Drought Fund Southern New South Wales Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub. The Southern Hub's primary physical location is in the Charles Sturt Agri Park in Wagga Wagga. AgriPark is Charles Sturt's flagship infrastructure precinct and the place for leading and growing the nation's agricultural sector. It's the ideal physical and digital shop front for the Southern New South Wales Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub. But it's not just the Riverina included in this project. The country we will cover takes in more than 3,000 farmers across Southern New South Wales, with communities from the Far West, the Riverina, the Monaro and Coastal Plains. The Southern New South Wales region includes a variety of farming system types that include aquaculture, dairy, dry land and irrigated cropping, meat and livestock production, perennial horticulture, including viticulture and extensive post-farm gate value-added enterprises. Over the next four years, the hub will maximise interaction among research partners and the agricultural sector providing farmers and communities across our region a voice to work on future farming challenges. The hub is supported by eight research, 29 industry, 19 government and four community organisations. Charles Sturt, as the hub lead, brings to the table its research expertise in the disciplines of agricultural and veterinary sciences, health and wellbeing, customs and excise, IT, cybersecurity, engineering, environmental sciences and indigenous studies. The Australian National University provides a key innovation linkage with CSIRO through its Agritech focused Centre for Entrepreneurial Agri-Technology and the newly established Institute for Water Futures. The Farming Systems Group Alliance, a collaboration of FarmLink and Farming Systems Groups, provides the link with primary producers through a network of over 3,000 farmers. This is a really important link to understand needs so we can design research, disseminate drought resilience outcomes and design new thinking about better ways to engage farmers with hub outcomes. 
The First Nations Governance Circle, once established, will provide access to the combined cultural knowledge of regional assemblies from across southern New South Wales to provide strategic leadership, direction and decision making related to Indigenous peoples' engagement with the hub. Local land services provide access to a large network of regional staff and officers. More than 60,000 landholders with properties larger than 10 hectares and have strong existing extension and adoption programs. New South Wales DPI is a long-term partner of Charles Sturt and provides expertise in agricultural, climate, water and ecological research and has facilities including experimental farms, glasshouses and laboratories. The significant network of 21 research stations and 600 staff and their industry networks within New South Wales, nationally and globally, will be engaged with the hub. Rural Aid has been and will continue to support rural communities to rebuild, repair and thrive during and after natural disasters. Rural Aid coordinate volunteers to support rural communities and counsellors to reduce stress, domestic violence and suicide in rural communities. Their network of counsellors form part of the hub's knowledge brokers network. The University of Canberra will connect education and research with community needs and requirements by fostering innovation and entrepreneurship and are key research partners of the hub. The University of Wollongong has strong representation on the New South Wales South Coast. Hosts I Accelerate, one of the most successful university-based research accelerators in Australia and has strong Indigenous programs such as Mind the Gap that addresses mental health. As a collective, these partners form the Southern New South Wales Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub. The hub activities will be delivered through the unique hub and spoke knowledge broken network across the region to develop and drive activities, engage with stakeholders and connect partner organisations. The knowledge broken network will develop tailored information, resources and services for those that require them, ensuring information is co-created, tailored and brings value. We're just getting started, but we have a lot of relevant research and connections in this space. We can't wait to get underway. And we can't wait to go to the Riverina and to join our two hosts for this particular segment. There's Andrew Bulkley. Hello, Andrew. There's Niall Blair. Hello, and Andrew. Hopefully Good day to you. Hopefully things are good on Bayless Street and take it away from the southern New South Wales hub. Yeah, look, thanks, everyone. And uh, um, really uh, need to kick off by saying that, unfortunately, the COVID has also disrupted uh, our event that we were hosting in Wagga Wagga. So you'll see us coming virtually from, from our living rooms, um, unfortunately. Look, I'd just like to, to kick off and um, Andrew is going to um, round out the final part of our presentation. But uh, before we start, I would just like to um, acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the lands in which we're all gathered here today. And uh, because our hub is going to be based um, in Wagga Wagga, that's on the land of the Wiradjuri people. And uh, the Indiamara Wingananara is a Wiradjuri term which um, Translated means the wisdom of respectfully knowing how to live well in a world worth living in. And I think that if you look at what we're all trying to achieve right across um, the country with our hubs, uh, the Indiamara Wingananara is, I think, a, a really good motto that we can um, all apply. Um, we'd like to thank the traditional custodians um, and uh, thank them for that, for their work and their custodianship and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. As I said, Andrew and I will take you through a little bit of an extension and an ex explanation from um, what we just saw in the, um, in the video there. Um, I'm the Interim Hub Director. I'm a Professor of Food Sustainability um, at Charles Sturt University. Um, and Andrew uh, is the CEO of FarmLink and uh, the role that our farming system groups um, play within our hub um, is going to be something that we're going to talk you through today because it's really pivotal to, to our approach. Um, some of you may know that prior to my role at Charles State University, I actually um, 
spent nearly 10 years in Parliament and I spent four years as the Minister for Agriculture in New South Wales. Now, I don't raise this for any other reason but just to um, highlight and thank the fact that uh, we are here today um, coming off the back of those of us that attended the, the drought summit that was held in Canberra, coming off the back of those really bad years, um, uh, particularly on the East Coast, where all governments were looking at a better way of doing business going forward so that we can all be more resilient and rather having to rely upon in-drought support measures. So I just wanted to reflect and, and thank um, not just Minister Littleproud, but also um, the Department of Ag, Water and Environment for, for getting us to this point because uh, this is a, a great initiative and the role that Brent and his team have done um, to get the Future Drought Fund um, plan in place and to get us here today is, is worth acknowledging. As you saw in our video, in southern New South Wales, we've, we've got some key partners that are bringing something um, very unique to the table. Um, we have a good mix of um, government research, but also extension and community organisations that are going to make up what we're saying is our tier one partners within, within the hub. And these are the partners that have brought um, either cash or in kind um, to our bid. Um, we are facilitating and, and have administered and um, brought the collaboration together um, from Charles Sturt University. But we couldn't have done this without the supporting role of, of our other key partners. Um, we, we saw um, in the video ANU, University of Canberra and University of Wollongong are our other university um, partners. And that gives us a really great footprint um, to be able to cover across um, southern New South Wales and really complement um, what each of the universities can offer when it comes to research, um, and particularly uh, not just from our geographic footprint, but the areas that we actually do work in. We also have a First Nations governance circle. Now this is um, bringing together the uh, number of assemblies that we have right across southern New South Wales to provide guidance, but also allow us to um, tap into our First Nation um, organisations and communities right across southern New South Wales. One of the key aspects that, that we're also doing with our hub is having an Indigenous knowledge broker. Um, we know that there's so much that we can learn from our um, First Nation groups, uh, but also we know that they're fundamental um, in making sure that anything that we come up in the resilience space and, and um, anything to do with our extension, that we make sure that we get out to those communities as well. We have um, New South Wales government on board through DPI and local land services. Um, DPI, um, predominantly through a lot of their research um, facilities and, and key personnel um, and their footprint right across um, New South Wales, but also um, with local land services that have the extension role in New South Wales, but also do a lot of work in natural resource management as well um, and emergency um, uh, preparedness and response. Rural aid, um, we're really blessed to have rural aid as part of our um, tier one partners um, within our hub. Rural aid have a number of councillors that they have positioned throughout um, southern New South Wales. And uh, we know that that social aspect um, and, and, and also the, the mental health impacts that we've seen um, that droughts have had um, um, right throughout our communities and our industries is something that we really wanted to make sure that we we had a strong um, partner there that can help us make sure that we have programs um, and reach out to, to our communities in, in a way that, uh, that they need. Um, so we're really happy to have Rural Aid there um, as, a, as a key partner. You know, one of the things that, that when we look back at the, the last drought, particularly as it gripped southern New South Wales, um, the issue of decision paralysis was something that I think those of us that lived through that drought um, really um, experienced people that uh, just couldn't make a decision. And that was really a, a really big stumbling block for them to be able to make um, a timely decision about what to do with their business going forward. Um, and uh, that's something that we, we hope Rural Aid can play a key role with um, to help us there. Andrew, as I said um, at the start, we'll talk um, a little bit more about our farming systems group. Now, we've been able to pull together a network of our farming systems um, groups from across southern New South Wales 
and uh, semi-formalise that. And we think this is a, a really great uh, way that we're approaching our hub in that we're making sure that we have a network of um, trusted um, knowledge brokers that are in the um, extension and adoption um, uh, business and, uh, and we're going to tap into that as part of a key way of getting our information um, through a two-way process um, out to those end users. Um, we haven't put it up here on the, the screen, but we had um, many, many other supporting partners um, from industry, um, other than uh, government entities, um, RDCs, CRCs, uh, who have uh, come on board and community groups. And it's great to see some of those uh, representatives today on the, the online chat having a, having a discussion. When you look at our footprint, um, we cover a very large area. Um, Although we have um, put a, a hard line for our footprint, one thing that we wanted to make sure is that we don't actually um, operate with a hard line. We think the key for, for a lot of um, our, our communities is to make sure that we have um, a fuzzy border or, or at least a porous border with our neighbouring hubs. And we're really keen to, to make sure that um, we work with other hubs, whether it's on a commodity basis or whether it's on a, a, a like community basis or whether it's an issue basis, to be able to share information and work across those borders. But as you can see, that we, uh, we do cover a very large um, part of um, uh, New South Wales and uh, through that there's some, um, a number of different areas that are, are worth pointing out. We have... Um, I think probably one of the, the most diverse um, growing conditions, soil types, altitude and um, uh, rainfall, probably within the country. Uh, when you think that within southern New South Wales, you can be um, obviously working with some of the dairy sector or, or some of the industries all, along the coast, um, even our forestry um, uh, areas, you can back on the Monero Plains, um, moving up into the Snowy Mountains, and then you can move, um, as you move further west, where we see a whole range of different um, uh, areas that include um, irrigation schemes coming off the, both the, the Murray um, and the Murrumbidgee rivers. Uh, we move right out west into, into the Darling and, uh, and also everything in between, including a number of other rivers. So we are a large part of the, the Murray-Darling Basin which means we have um, irrigation and dry land um, uh, um, business enterprises throughout. And then we also have um, a whole range of commodities, whether it's from um, perennial horticulture um, right through to, to um, viticulture. Uh, we have cotton, we have almonds, um, we have obviously um, all of our uh, livestock enterprises and a very large footprint of um, both um, winter and summer uh, cropping enterprises throughout southern New South Wales as well. Uh, so it's really diverse um, and because of, uh, I guess, the, the size of it, because of the different catchments and because of that diversity, we also have different impacts, um, particularly when we experience droughts. Um, when you look at southern New South Wales and you look at what's happened over the last um, few years as well, we have been severely impacted not just by drought but also bushfires and more recently um, the mice play. So hopefully when we talk about resilience, we don't just um, focus on um, drought. We, we know that our communities have been as um, impacted by bushfires and, and the mice plague um, of, of recent times. We're in the process of, of building our team. Um, now I'm, I'm here today as the interim director, but we're really happy to announce that um, Cindy Cassidy is coming on board to, to be our director and um, she's kicked off um, this week and uh, we're really excited to have Cindy on board. Cindy um, has uh, just spent um, uh, her last her role was with um, the Bureau of Meteorology looking after the agricultural portfolio there. She's a former CEO of um, uh, FarmLink, a former Rural Woman of the Year and also a, a board member of uh, AgriFutures. So we're really happy um, that Cindy's decided to come on and, and take on this role. Um, we're in the market for a lot of our other roles, including our um, Chief Knowledge Broker role, and, uh, and we also then will be going through the process of um, embedding our network of knowledge brokers um, throughout our footprint right throughout southern New South Wales. And that will be um, 
um, embedding them with our host um, partners that are, are looking to make sure that they've got a home for our um, knowledge brokers throughout the state. Our structure when it comes to governance is we're an unincorporated um, joint venture where all of our um, tier one partners that have contributed um, through that in kind and also cash have um, will then get a, a seat on our our board. And then sitting below that is an, an agricultural innovation council, and that's um, going to be made up of a number of our experts that are going to provide. Um, that technical advice um, and uh, and help us through a lot of the, the co-design, um, identifying the priorities and making sure that uh, we are actually focusing our efforts um, in the areas that need it the most. Um, we, we, like some of the other hubs, have a hub and spoke model with our um, hub being um, housed in our agri-park at uh, Wagga Wagga um, on the Charles Sturt University campus. And then um, our, our satellite sites will be, as I said, spread throughout southern New South Wales and housed within our, our partner organisations. And they're the ones that I've mentioned will also have our um, knowledge broker network throughout New South Wales. I'm going to hand over to Andrew now just to talk through um, why uh, a hub focused on tapping into the farming system groups is um, so important and, um, and how that's come about. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Noel. Um, I guess that the Southern New South Wales Drought Hub will really deliver real value through a user-centred approach. So building and maintaining a strong connection to our farmers, producers and regional communities in general with our hub partners and other hubs will be essential to realising meaningful change in the context of drought readiness, of resilience and uh, of recovery. So. Um, the Farming System Group uh, has formed up an alliance and it's a group of like-minded, passionate and driven farmer-led organisations that operate across what's a very rich and diverse landscape of southern New South Wales that uh, Noel referred to. Um, for some 20 years we've been undertaking a range of collaborative research, development and extension activity um, really that try to deliver value that brings profitability and sustainability to our members. Um, and the regional community in which they live. Um, so, so the FSGA is, comprises, uh, as, as is noted on the slide there, Riverine Plains, Central West Farming Systems, Holbrook Land Care Network, Southern Growers and Irrigated Cropping Council and Irrigated Research and Extension Committee and ourselves FarmLink. Now our membership covers an area of about 22 million hectares and we're obviously working across a suite of commodities that you know, again Niall referred to earlier agriculture, viticulture, horticulture, aquaculture, we're, we're sort of touching everything in the region. And I guess what drives us is, is, our, is our membership's commitment. So we have over 3,000 members and they're growing and we believe we're well placed to make a significant contrib contribution to achieving the vision of the Minister, the Department of Ag and the Hub Network. Um, now it's early days for us. Um, but we're, we're extremely positive about the possibilities and benefits that can be delivered in the journey ahead. And I think importantly, the collaboration that will come through this, not just within the hub, but across the national footprint. Thanks, Noel. Uh, the other point just to pick up on here was the Agriculture Innovation Council that Noel referred to. And, and I guess, again, it's another governance um, approach that we want to put in place to ensure we've got sound collaboration and co-design. Um, and it's, it's tended to be very inclusive forum comprising representatives from the farming systems groups, from other hub partners, the chief knowledge broker and even farmers. So really getting the coalface involved. And this is really about ensuring that the priorities are always user centred and that, um, that we're supporting the entire region, the entire commodity base that we're representing. So the AIC will also be about identifying and reviewing ideas and initiatives and projects and to make sure that they're adoption ready and that they're, again, they're always relevant to what's, what's being asked for uh, at the coalface. And of course, we'll provide recommendations um, to the board uh, as needed uh, as we go through this. So that's a bit of a snapshot of the Innovation Council. Um, and that was, uh, I might just pass back to Noel to wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And, and look, thanks everyone for your time. As Andrew mentioned, it is early days for us. Um, we uh, took a, a, a very 
strong view uh, on the early days that we wanted this to be a, a real collaboration and we've been working with our partners um, to build together, I think, what we think is a, a good vision but also a, a real partnership um, throughout southern New South Wales. That's been tough. Um, there's no doubt there's um, you know a lot of work that goes into having to, to collaborate and get a consensus on a range of areas. Um, but we think now we have um, the, the, the framework in place to be able to have a successful hub. Um, first job will be hopefully to come up with a, a catchier name rather than the really long acronym or the long name that we all have. But uh, other than that, we might just call ourselves the Premier Hub and uh, be done with it. Andrew, thanks for that. Um, we're happy to, to take any questions. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Yes, the, the, the acronyms can get the better of us sometimes. Uh, yeah, tough conversations. Tough conversations, and but good outcomes. Right, we have some questions. Let's start um, with this one from Paul McDonald. Can you expand on how the Indigenous governance will work across the nodes? We've heard from all of our hubs about how this is a crucial part of what they're doing. But in, in the particular case of the Southern New South Wales model, uh, how does that Indigenous government governance work and how does it fit in to the rest of what you're up to? Andrew, Niall, or the both of you? Yeah, look, thanks. It's a, it's an interesting concept. The, the, the governance circle is something that Charles Sturt, um, as a university, has been working with some of our First Nation um, assemblies uh, and, and trying to, to formalise and bring together. And we thought this was a good opportunity to to bring it into the hub um, and, and help speed up that process. So again, it is early days, um, um, but we wanted to make sure that our First uh, First Nation communities um, had a, a seat um, on the board and uh, and do doing that through the, the governance circle. As anyone that has worked in some of this area um, would know, um, quite often it, it, it's a real challenge to make sure that we represent um, all of the First Nation um, organisations, whether they, are, whether they are land council, where in, in southern New South Wales we also have First Nation um, water representative groups. Um, so there is a whole range of, of different um, uh, communities that, uh, that need to be represented, and this is our attempt to try and bring them together in, through this government circle. So early days, we'll be really happy to, to share um, um, how that's progressing with the other hubs and, and everyone that's interested. Uh, now we've got our first combo question of the forum. Uh, Stephen Laid and Chad Renando have come up, we've sort of put them in the mix master and come up with one question. Niall talked about multiple threats aside from droughts, for example, mice and obviously bushfires. Are there plans or is there work underway to understand how these multiple threats interact to amplify risk and undermine resilience? I mean, obviously drought is your meat and potatoes, but you can't occupy a vacuum, I, I guess. Look, I mean, you know, the, the issues, whether it is drought or bushfire or, or mice, I guess if we peel that back, when we look at some of the ways that we prevent these things or how we respond to them, um, I guess we've got a similar methodology and, and, and formula that we can probably apply. We need to look at um, research. We need to make sure that we look at um, impacts. We need to look at the, 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 the business models and the systems in which we're operating under. But we also need to look at the, the impacts that go beyond um, the farm gate and um, we see the response from government um, in a lot of these areas that, that is also very similar, whether it's a bushfire or a drought or, or something like a, a mouse plague. So I think what we have an opportunity to do here is, although we're focusing on predominantly drought in the first instance, um, we need to look at how we can get better collaboration and I guess the, the formula to build resilience, prepare for, and then hopefully respond to um, these events as they occur. Obviously, we'd like to focus on the um, build resilience and prepare for part so that we have less of the uh, the um, responding to at the back end. But I think that what we're doing in this drought space, we should all be very prepared to be able to prepare to a range of 
events that we have um, right throughout Australia. And, and that, you know, whether they're storms uh, or tempests, whether it's a severe frost, whether it's um, the impact of climate change, whether it's a mouse plague, whether it's a locust plague or a bushfire, I guess, you know, we're all working in the same space for this. So we think that we should be agile enough to adopt it to, to any of those situations. Yeah, agility is so important, isn't it? And I guess you change one thing and everything else changes as, as well. Uh, Gemma Wyburn has got this question. How will you balance all the different needs of the different stakeholders? Hearing a lot of talk about big industries today, says Gemma. What about the smaller ones and the intensives? How are they being engaged? I think the, the key for that is making sure that, that we have a network um, that is spread geographically, but also through all the communities and the business types to be able to, to pick, pick up the small enterprises right through to the large ones. And the other thing is that, you know, we've got a lot of other partners uh, within the hub that are post farm gate or provide um, on farm services. And, and we need to make sure that uh, we, we do um, look at the impacts that things like drought has on the broader community and um, and I think that through our network of knowledge brokers we want to be able to make sure that we we provide the support where it's needed um, and that that's not exclusive to to the big end of town um, Andrew might comment on the the types of membership with the farming systems groups we've got you know corporates right through to the smaller farmer um, family um, enterprises there as well. So Andrew, do you want to maybe have a crack at that as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Noel. As, as Noel alluded to, we we in the Farming Systems Group do have corporate partners. Uh, we're working with other government agencies and we've got, you know, uh, just normal regular farms and other enterprises that we're associated with. So not everyone that is members is necessarily farming. Um, and I think one of the things to note with these hubs is that this is taking collaboration to a whole new level. And I think over the course of the next few years, what we'll start to see is far more conversations um, that, that are going to happen within communities and far more listening going on that will then drive action that's really relevant to them. So I think you'll get uh, more of an appetite for engagement than we've ever seen. I think that's a key point to note as well. I noticed from the, the introductory video that there, there was reference to mental health. And I know in recent times, there's been some increased spending in certainly in the Riverina, southern New South Wales region. But Wagga got somebody and Griffith isn't going to get somebody. Um, is there what kind of a role perhaps do, do these hubs have in being part of a broader community conversation about how mental health fits into creating drought resilience and community resilience? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why we have Rural Aid as, as one of our um, tier one partners here. Uh, you know, we also, I know within a lot of our universities, we'll be engaging um, with uh, with parts of the university that, uh, that can provide better guidance, particularly on mental health and, and the impacts of, um, of that on on not just our you know producers but everyone within our community so i think it's it's front and center in what we uh, are trying to achieve here we know it's had a huge impact the the suicide rates um in regional communities are, are, are way too high um and um i don't think that there's anyone um that has lived and worked within the sector through a drought that can't uh, nominate someone that, that did it pretty tough or, or know someone um, that's been impacted by um, mental health issues and quite often a lot of those have been um, brought on by, by, you know, severe impacts of drought. So yeah, rural aid and also the experts within um, our research partners are, are going to be key uh, to make sure that if there are if there is a community that maybe um, has missed out through another program, maybe we have the ability through, through our hub to provide linkages or other services or services in a way that, um, that may be a little bit more agile or innovative that uh, haven't been thought of yet. That's part of the challenge and, and I think some of the things that we're here to try and address going forward. Uh, thanks, Don. And of course, uh, don't forget there are support networks there. There's Lifeline, there's local support services. So if 
any discussion during these three days about that these kind of things in the mental health area is a triggering event there is support out there and uh, and it's and it's available at uh, at the end of a phone call or by contacting people online just to say that there to a question that's really very much on the ground here from uh, Christine Augie in Canberra from a research perspective how do you balance the needs between the drier west to the higher production in the east I guess what it is each one of these hubs it's a somewhat and I don't this is not a pejorative term it's a somewhat artificial area because you have to draw a line somewhere although I did note you saying you don't want to be too hard and fast on that line but how how do you balance the needs between almost diametrically opposed needs between one half and the other half of, of the region? Well, I think this is the, the real challenge that we all have. And when you look at all of the hubs, we've probably got commodities, challenges, soil types, um, businesses that are similar um, in, in probably one or two or, or three different hubs. And, and I think where we are going to balance the needs is to work with um, not just our partners within the hub, but also the other hubs. Um, we, we can't be everything to everyone. And that's why, I mean, I, I can take probably a, an example. If we've got a particular challenge for um, our wine growers, maybe in Griffith, then we firstly should speak to what's happening in South Australia down at their hub and, and, and see if they've got a similar issue or if they've already started working on it. Because my biggest fear is that we don't want the hubs to, to, to start duplicating. We've got to all talk together. We've got to speak to our RDCs. We've got to speak to our local uh, research um, organisations, universities, um, governments, etc. And uh, we work out who's going to, to go next. Um, what we have here now is the best group um, that's been brought together than, than I can identify in the time that I've been working in the industry. I started out as a horticulturalist 20 odd years ago to be able to make sure that we don't duplicate. So that's why, this is not answering the question, I know that, um, but I don't think we have the answer to be everything to everyone in southern New South Wales. Collectively, I think we can do it, um, and that's, uh, that's what I think, the, the great hope that we have um, by linking all of this together. We talked about difficult conversations a little bit earlier. Sometimes you actually have to say, no, we don't know, or... As you've just said, no, we can't be all things to all people. A question from South Australia, actually, from Mark Stanley, um, who says, it's great to see a farming systems group alliance being formed in southern New South Wales. Um, pure and simple, who is, who are the key contacts? Where can Mark and others find out a little bit more? Well, the key contacts are obviously on the the uh, original website, um, and uh, we've also got our own. Uh, sorry, the, the the website through Canberra. Um, there's some key contacts there, but uh, I'm not sure if my screen is still sharing or not. But I, I we do have a link to to our um, re, uh, website at the moment, and we're also happy to to make sure that we get uh, our key contacts put out um, once Cindy is up and running. Um, that, that'll be great. She'll be able to make contact as well. Um, just a note too, the beauty about having an interactive um, seminar like this, I've been getting some some text messages coming through from those of you online, and the answer is no. Not everyone in southern New South Wales has a haircut and looks like Andrew and I. Um, there's a lot more diversity throughout the uh, throughout southern New South Wales as well. <laughs> but being told we look like the two Ronnies. So, but um, seriously, we'll make sure that uh, that our contact details are well and truly. Um, distributed throughout uh, throughout to everyone, every participant. And on that note, it's good night from him and <laughs> good night from him. Uh, Andrew Nile from Charles Sturt University and the Southern New South Wales. Thank you so much for your time. And we've had three hubs so far and we've heard such similarities, such different stories, different emphasis, and also what's already coming out is inter-hub activity. It's, there's the intra-hub with the hub and the nodes and the spokes, but there's also inter-hub 
activity. Their geography doesn't mean that you have the sole ownership of wisdom. Now, we're, um, we are all in the afternoon now, wherever we are, whichever time zone we are in. It's coming up to 20 to 3 in the east, which means it's 20 to 1 in the west, and 10 past 2 in Central Australia. We're going to move on to something um, interactive in just a moment. Well, in fact, we're going to do it now because we're halfway through the afternoon. So can we just take a pause? Perhaps some of you already nipped out, put the kettle on. Let's just get up and have a bit of a shake and all that kind of stuff that you get told you're supposed to do when we're all meeting together with lots of lollies on the table and all those post-it notes that you stick on the wall back there. We're doing it virtually today, but just keep active and, um, and make sure you hydrate as well. So there we go. Yeah. Where do we go next? We go into investing and investing in drought resilience, the National Drought Resilience Research and Adoption Investment Plan. Now, Michelle Aykroyd leads the research and adoption program at the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment, and she is going to join us to introduce the plan, and she's going to be followed by a presentation, and here's where the interactivity comes in, from Alluvium Consulting, who've been in engaged to develop the plan. So get ready to get even more interactive and I'll cross over now to Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session um, on the Future Drought Fund Research and Adoption Investment Plan. I'm really pleased to be able to just introduce the investment plan to you today and really give you the context and, uh, and the principles in what we're trying to achieve in developing this plan. But firstly, I'd just like to give you the context of where it sits within the Research and Adoption Program. Now, the Research and Adoption Program has a funding of $117 million to the end of June 2024. And this funding is really about driving innovation and achieving impact on the ground in building um, drought resilience that's developed through a collaborative, participatory and co-design process. So firstly, I think, you know, you've already heard from some of our hubs this morning and we have more hubs presenting over the next two days of the forum, but they're really the centrepiece of the program. They have um, $79 million um, to support the eight adoption and innovation hubs. And this is really to support the networks and collaboration and to facilitate a co-design process over the next six months to finalise detailed activities that they'll develop and implement until June 2024. As part of that process, we're looking at opportunities to support hubs through um, employing adoption officers and to create some additional projects or hub projects to support those activities. We're also running um, innovation grants, $30 million, and you'll hear more about this in the last session on the last day. Um, and lastly, there's a whole raft of enabling activities that um, we are undertaking to ensure that there is appropriate support for national delivery and coordination. And this includes the investment plan with, and I'll go through the timelines in a moment, but the interim report will be available in early July. We're um, having annual science to practice forums that are really flagging, so put it in your calendars now, the next one for March 2022, um, as well as exploring and developing knowledge management, digital platform systems and open data access to make sure that all the investments in the research and adoption program are available and accessible to everyone. And it's also important that we assess the program impact and learn from our implementation to make sure that our program is well targeted and effective into the future. So in terms of the research and adoption investment plan, this is really about um, creating a living document. So we want to make sure that it's current and reflects emerging issues and priorities as we're implementing um, the Future Drought Fund and the research and adoption program specifically. So this process started back in April, May this year with some stakeholder workshops and surveys to get some initial input um, from our stakeholders in identifying those priorities. Um, as part of um, the forum today and Thursday, um, there'll be a presentation um, on the current priorities, but also a workshop 
like I said, on the Thursday to get your input um, and feedback from the last few days because I'm sure with the presentations here about the hubs, there might be some priorities or concepts and ideas that really come front of mind. So firstly, we want you to add it to the comment um, section of the presentation so we can capture that and put it in a parking lot. And so we want to come back to you on Thursday um, with all your comments and perhaps some approaches and kind of bringing that together, but also an opportunity to have discussion about any emerging issues and refocusing of priorities, um, you know, from your discussions over the next couple of days. So the next step after the forum is to have a written interim investment plan um, and that will be used to support the hubs in that co-design process over the next six months. And so we're really looking at making sure that the hubs have information to connect to national priorities, um, to ensure that there is some alignment but also opportunity where we can collaborate across hubs in particular. Then once that six month process is completed, we'll come back to the investment plan and refresh to make sure that we haven't missed anything um, or pick up opportunities that the hubs have identified in that six month process. And then in February 2022, we expect to have that, I'll say final research and adoption investment plan, but in reality, we'll come back and refresh that every year. So it's a living document, but there's a process to get a final um, report finished early next year with input from the hubs as well as stakeholders through that process. So the investment plan is really a focus on that innovation pipeline and application and deployment of existing research knowledge and tools. And so we really want to understand um, those cross-sectoral drought resilience priorities in particular, as well as investment in transformational drought resilience innovation. And this is really important because we want to make sure that we do have that pipeline um, of innovation in that 10 to 15 year horizon. So while research isn't a priority at the moment, we do want to make sure that we are aware of the opportunities in terms of those highest priorities to be able to inform that pipeline so we have continuous opportunities for that adoption extension to support transformation in drought resilience in the ag sector. And so it is a priority that we also recognise that whole agricultural value chain is really important in being able to identify those drought resilience priorities and opportunities in terms of deployment and investment in transformational drought resilience. So the investment plan will identify those priority drought resilience research, development, adoption, extension and commercialisation opportunities that are really across those three um, time horizons. So the first being that deployment of best practice and tested innovations. You know, those ready to adopt um, research practices and tools um, that are on the shelf um, and are ready to go. We are also really interested in the opportunities to frame current knowledge and existing information into different formats and tools to make it more accessible and available for a range of audiences. Um, the next um, horizon, which is more that, you know, two to five year, is really testing those emerging practices and techniques. So um, we've got some really great solutions and ideas. They just need a bit of piloting and testing before they can move to deployment. Um, and then the final is the enabling research, which I've mentioned already. It's not the highest priority um, for us, but we do want to make sure that we're identifying high priority enabling research to maintain that pipeline of innovation in the longer term. Not only will it um, support the innovative um, thinking as we are up uh, deploying and testing innovations, it does create that pipeline. So we have new things coming on board um, in that 10 to 15 year horizon. And we've got you know, the ability to really transform um, businesses in the ag sector. So what will the investment plan look like? Now, this is my um, vision of where we're going to end up that it's very clear that we need to meet the funding plan of the Future Drought Fund um, and the three objectives um, to support um, drought resilience. But what we're trying to do here in the investment plan are identify those priorities that fit within those three time horizons as well as the ag value chain. And that is why we're really interested in making sure that we have diverse stakeholders providing input and review into this process. So we get your feedback, your priorities, and then look at you know, being able to distill it into that national framework. 
So thank you for your time today and I hope I've given you a bit of insight into um, you know, the context and the overview and expectations of the Research and Adoption Investment Plan. Now next up, Alluvium will be presenting on the detail and providing insights um, in terms of the outcomes from the stakeholder engagement so far and the emerging priorities they have identified through that process. Thank you. So we really are now getting into the nitty and the gritty and Bill and Katie from Alluvium are going to join us for the next little while, next 40 minutes or so, to get more into what we mean. Uh, they be, uh, mean, mean about this National Drought Resilience Research and Adoption Investment Plan. Alluvium have been contracted to draft the plan, so let's pass it over to Katie and Bill. Over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, let, let's get started. Um, so, yeah, I suppose um, I've, I'm, my name's Bill Molden. Uh, I work for Alluvium Consulting. I've been uh, in NRM and, um, you know, environmental water um, space for, you know, 10, 15 years. Uh, and uh, Katie's from the Australian Farm Institute, um, a, a non-profit uh, research institute that um, does research to inform agricultural policy. So we've been working very closely on this over the last uh, couple of months. Um, I suppose first I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners from all the places that we're uh, meeting from or uh, phoning in from today. Um, for me here in Brisbane, that's the Jaeger and Turbul people, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and future. Uh, so as mentioned, we're talking about the investment plan here. There's three things we're really going to cover. So we're talking about the, the process and the results um, from, from the engagement. So we've been talking to a whole ton of people over the last couple of months, uh, a lot of broad and intensive conversations. We're going to share the results of that. Um, we're going to start talking about the structure uh, of the investment plan, building a little bit on what um, Michelle's shared already. Um, and then finally, uh, we'd like to get some feedback um, from everybody who's here today, really about trying to get to the nitty gritty of what uh, next year's investment priorities are. So we've heard a lot from hundreds of people uh, and it's to try and winnow that out and not to, not to lose sight of all the things that we've captured, but to really try and identify what's the immediate priority for next year um, and, and onwards after that. So our, our engagement took place uh, over three phases or is taking place over three phases. So we started off in a very much information gathering um, uh, phase, really trying to target uh, research users. So not just primary producers, but um, users from all across the, um, across the value chain. Phase two uh, is more about, uh, you know, it, it's getting information, but it's also s starting to share some of our learnings from uh, phase one, uh, really targeting research providers, uh, research institutions, universities, uh, and trying to build, build on some of that information. Uh, and then, of course, moving into phase three, uh, which today is part of, uh, it's really about sharing the results and trying to inform the, tr trying to inform the investment plan. So phase one had uh, had two components. We had uh, we had some workshops, and we also had uh, an online survey, uh, and just um, that was informed by a discussion paper. So uh, in, a, in our in our phase one workshops, uh, we were really um, introducing some drought resilience concepts. So it's pretty pretty high level, just trying to get the um, get the mental juices flowing, uh, and then. Two really key questions there um, in, in phase one is what, what is going to promote adoption? What's going to help us take that first step? But, and then also priorities for investment in research. Uh, now, the way we structured these, um, these workshops was pretty, pretty intense work. So it was, it was a couple of hours and we, we, we had a, a main group uh, and then we break out into, into groups of you know, around about half a dozen. Uh, up to 60 people in, in these workshops. So we don't go off and have our intensive conversations then come back to the, come back to the group. Uh, we also had a survey um, that was based on a discussion paper. 
So uh, the department's done a fair bit of work uh, around a stock take report um, that was trying to identify some research priorities. Uh, that was mainly um, engaged with research providers and um, service providers as well, so extension um, consultants, uh, agronomists and, and the like. So they, they had half a dozen um, uh, identified research priorities in that paper. So we tried to sort of summarise that. Uh, and part of the survey was to get um, get people to, to rate that and, and talk about that. Phase two, uh, we're, we're moving into targeting the, the research providers more. Uh, and the way, the way that we've structured that was we, were, you know, we, we had a similar format with the, with the breakout rooms, but we we're asking people to identify their research priorities and their adoption priorities first up. Then we were sharing uh, our results from, from phase one uh, and trying to, trying to bring, pull those two things together and look for, look for commonalities to try and identify some of the priorities there. Um, so a bit of a snapshot of results. So in, in our phase one workshops, we had four workshops um, targeted at Northern Australia, Eastern, uh, Southeastern and Southern. Um, so four workshops had about 160 people attend um, all up, um, around about one third uh, research users to two thirds providers. Uh, for, for the survey, um, probably got a bit more uh, interest in that uh, just because it's not so, so time intensive. So it, it's not a two, three hour uh, investment there. We had uh, 193 responses, or about half of them were research users uh, and about half of them weren't, hadn't previously been engaged by future drought funds. So um, Katie and the, and the team at AFI there were really uh, instrumental in you know, getting a new network uh, of, of people outside of um, what the departments, uh, who the departments already engaged there. Um, phase two workshops, we had about uh, 70 attendees uh, at um, uh, a single workshop aimed uh, specifically at research providers uh, and then around 10 participants in a few small workshops that um, Katie did with some of the uh, industry bodies there. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of feedback uh, around uh, the, the engagement process. Um, time of year and amount of time uh, was a bit of a limit on um, some of the some of the research users uh, being able to get involved, uh, particularly the um, people in the cropping industries. Uh, very busy time of year for them. Uh, two or three hour online workshop um, wasn't really going to work for them, uh, but we did manage to pick up a few people uh, in the survey there. Uh, we did get a lot of positive um, feedback from the workshop. Um, you know, people emailing, uh, putting um, uh, putting feedback uh, up on the web page. Um, you know, it's certainly um, I'd reflect that uh, had a lot of really uh, intensive and very um, in interesting discussions in those workshops. Um, so what we'll present here today, I suppose, is the breadth of, of what we've found, but it doesn't really do justice to some of the really detailed and quite intense, intensive conversations that we had there. And we're really going to try and pull out some of that uh, some of that learning and some of that information in the investment plan to, to do it justice. Um, I suppose it's worth mentioning that in the phase one, a lot of the discussion really did gravitate towards uh, deployment, adoption and extension um, of, of existing research. Uh, and the research users aren't really um, distinguishing between uh, research into production, drought resilience, uh, environmental sustainability, it's, it's kind of all, all, all the same uh, and it's just viewed as all being useful in terms of having a better, uh, better business uh, and, and being able to um, incorporate that into, into business. Peer-to-peer um, -peer networks, uh, participatory learning, obviously everybody's really, um, really interested in that. Um, I think that gets to point three there as well. Um, in that people really wanting to see the research um, translated into a demonstrated business model. So it's not just information, but it's a demonstration of how it can be incorporated into a, um, into a production business and be successful. Um, 
a need to uh, improve capacity of research providers to translate and communicate and be able to put it into, into that sort of uh, format, um, whether it's the pr providers themselves or you know, somebody, somebody in between, there is, the, there is a real um, need for capacity in that extension and adoption um, space. A lot of people talking about information overload. Uh, there's a huge amount of information products uh, available uh, it's almost you know too much to process, and people uh, really did, uh, I suppose, identify a need to be able to consolidate that and to be able to filter it out to to just the the important stuff. Um, it's great to see everybody talking about the whole supply chain uh, and the you know Michelle calls it the value chain, uh, and I've heard that a lot today. Um, everybody in our workshops was uh, bringing that up too. Um, an acknowledgement that some of the capital intensive uh, industries, you know, may be a bit, uh, a bit quicker at um, getting the, uh, getting the research incorporated into uh, standard practice, uh, and of course that adoption needs to happen all the time, not just, not just during droughts. So research and application, it, again, a wealth of ideas. Uh, we've tried to pick out some of the main ones here. Uh, it doesn't cover everything that was that was discussed, but we have brought out some of the major ones and and really put them up there in terms of, I suppose, social, uh, the economic and the environmental um, aspects of resilience. Um, in terms of social resilience, a uh, lot of interest in it, you know, huge amount of discussion, it, you know, how to measure it and what actually is the, I suppose, output uh, of it. Um, isn't isn't well known, so I suppose development of a common language there. Um, and I've heard a few people, um, you know, asking questions today already about, you know, what uh, what are the processes and characteristics of resilient communities? You know, the um, the strong strong leadership and good governance. Uh, you know, that, that's come out already today, and that's certainly something we heard there. Uh, and then the mental health thing. That's, that's uh, you know heard a bit about that, um, and that that has to happen. You know, good time and bad. Um, so it's, it's an ongoing commitment to, to building mental health and communities there. Uh, we had some, some really uh, innovative and exciting thinking in terms of financial arrangements. So some, some interesting, um, you know, quite a few people from the finance sector were involved uh, and, and hearing some interesting ideas there. Uh, you know, obviously the need to smooth out the highs and the lows and be able to um, maintain capital through good times and bad uh, is really critical there. Um, and some really strong links to some of the environmental um, uh, aspects of drought resilience coming through there in the, in the finance, um, you know, access to, to markets, uh, assurance programs, particularly, um, you know, international markets, it's, um, starting, to, starting to be a really key, um, uh, key factor in marketing there. Uh, and the, the economics of carbon. So, you know, you know, carbon has benefits, you know, on the farm and off the farm and trying to quantify that and turn that into a, uh, into a viable business model. Um, you know, interesting to, to hear from the um, Southern New South Wales hub here today. Um, a lot of that talk about um, research systems, uh, sorry, um, farming systems uh, came through in our um workshop uh, in in the eastern eastern Australia there uh, and and looking at, at the landscape scale and getting some diversity on the farm um, really the measuring of natural capital uh, the, there's a balance there between you know needing to have some common language to be able to you know access markets um you know biodiversity um, offsets or credits uh, but also to have information that is relevant to local situations or targets so you know it, what constitutes an improvement uh on a really degraded bit of land um, is going to look different from something that's you know already in good condition and trying to go that go that next step. So a lot of um, ideas of, around work that needs to be done to help measure natural capital and, and um, turn it into a business proposition. Uh, fire uh, obviously came up um, a, a lot. Whoops, sorry, one more. Um, and 
not just the interaction of fire and drought, but also about you know ongoing fire management and how that uh, you know builds resilience you know over the medium to, to longer term. In terms of uh, some of the some of the priorities that have been identified uh, in the in the previous stock take report. Um, this is some, some feedback from research users um, in, you know, in the survey. Um, I've kind of juiced the results a bit here. Um, the, the scale on the left there is from 6 to 8.5, but that's just to try and highlight the, the difference um, in, in ratings there. You know, everything's important, um, but again, this risk management uh, thing really comes out um, as 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 the highest priority. So every, everybody's rating that that very highly. Um, certainly the um, research users and primary producers there. Uh, and, and interesting that this uh, you know participatory research and um, needing to build on the existing R and D system rather than replace it uh, came out quite highly there. Interesting also, I suppose the lowest rated. Um, priority, um, getting more information from products and platforms. Uh, perhaps that reflects some of what we were hearing in the workshops around information overload uh, and the people feeling that there's enough information there already and it's about um, being able to translate it into a um, business model that's uh, really key here. And being able to, you know, having the skills to incorporate that information and use it in a, you know, a risk assessment for for business um, to be able to make good, good and timely decisions. In terms of how we're going to organise it in the investment plan, um, there's no there's no perfect way to group or, or split um, all, all the things that we've heard, but we've had a go here uh, and we've organised things into six priority directions uh, that you can see on the left there, and 21 you know more detailed focus areas on the right. So we're talking about securing the natural resource base, forecasts and predictions, uh, and, and so forth. Um, we'll work on this a little bit, but this is, you know, the basic structure of what um, what it is that we're going to talk about in the in the investment plan. So um, you should expect to see this uh, in in the investment plan uh, in the next month or so. Um, Building on what um, Michelle was talking about here, uh, we're going to be really focusing in on this uh, deployment and applied research and application end of the research pipeline in this iteration of the um, of the investment plan. Um, I think we've identified um, a, some enabling research there, but. For the time being, we, we're really focusing on the here and now, uh, what's what's available right now, um, and what do we need to do just to um, get those uh, practices and new methods um, and research um, adopted there. So that brings us really to our survey. So what we'd like to do um, now is to build on what we've identified as what those key focus areas are and for, for all of you to, uh, to pick out your five focus areas um, and really, you know, th this will help us, uh, you know, work out uh, the agenda for Thursday when, we, when we're going to come back and talk with you, with you guys again. So. Uh, I think Katie's going to take over now um, and, you know, we're going to do a bit of an interactive poll um, and Katie's going to talk us through that. So thanks, Katie. Um, thanks, I'll Bill. stop sharing. Uh, I think yeah. the people behind the scenes are going to do that for us. So if we can pop the, um, the Slido screen up now as well so everyone can see it. I've popped a link in the chat there, but it doesn't look like it's a live link, which is frustrating. But if you can just type in Slido into a browser window, and then the code there you can see is DRRA, Drought Resilience Research Adoption Plan. 
there is a QR code. I don't know if that works. I've never tried to use a QR code off the screen, but you're welcome to give it a try. And make sure you scroll through. So you can see six there listed on the screen. Let me just see if this will change as I scroll my screen. It should do. Fantastic. We've put there all 21 of the focus areas that Bill had up before. So those all belong, as you can see, with the, the 6.2, the 5.2. They belong to the six different focus area priorities. <clears throat> it's working. Fantastic. Thanks for the, the chat there. Um, what we want you to do is just choose your top five. Uh, you won't be able to choose any more than five because Slido won't let you. Make sure you scroll through. We do want you to do this right now, but having said that, there's not a massive rush. Don't just click the first five things you see. Make sure you scroll through and, and have a look. And um, if there's any questions about the focus areas, because separated from the priorities, sometimes they might be a little out of context, please pop them in the comments there and we can, uh, we can answer it. The link is live. Thank you, Rachel. That's great. So we want to encourage... All of you, I'm sure there's more than five people online right now <coughs> to get in there, excuse me, and choose your top five out of those priorities. Keeping in mind that, as Bill said earlier, everything is important, everything is interesting. There's, they've all been identified throughout this extensive consultation process, so we know that these are things that you do care about, and not voting for them right now doesn't mean that they'll never get done. We're just curious to see what the, the most urgent priorities are for this group of people, and we'll take that into the workshop on Thursday. So we can see things that are starting to pop up there. Also interesting to see which ones are not getting your votes, which ones are getting your votes. And we'll give you a couple more moments. I should also add that if you are having any trouble or you're distracted and you're looking at your phone or you're coming back to this in a second and going, wait, I missed this bit, this will stay live all day tomorrow as well. And we can also circulate it if you wanted to email any of us if you've got the email addresses. Bill might pop his email address in the chat there just in case anyone says, yeah. wait, can I send this to a few relevant people? Uh, because we would like to sort of see how these priorities fall out amongst this, this wider group of stakeholders, not just the people who are tuned in for this particular moment of this particular three-day forum. So we'll keep this live all day tomorrow as well. And then we can discuss the top five as identified by you as a group when we re-meet on Thursday. Um, Bill, you have put your email address into the private chat instead of the comments. So I'll just get you uh, a copy okay. to the other screen there. Sorry. That's all right. On tab. No worries, Niall. I'm glad you found it easy. More behind the scenes work to make something work to get work easily on the day. And Bill, you've also missed a letter in your email address there, so it's going to go one more oh, time. <laughs> That's Somebody's right, it's getting, file, okay. time. We're getting close to 100. I'm going to keep on chatting and filling in time until we get to 100 responses there on the poll. So I'll give you more time. It is chat. It's like watching a race in real time. Good fun. Of course, we should also note that some of these things are quite strongly linked to each other, that um, there are strong connections between them. They don't necessarily stand alone, of course. And there were, as part of this poll, once we've managed to get as, as many responses to the survey as we can. We'll also put up a couple of freeform text boxes that you can drop in some thoughts on how they link together or how they could link together better. <laughs> I'm also cheering for 6.1, Chad, but let's not say that because we might prejudice the results. And I think at 115, we can uh, call it going once, going twice, passing back to Bill for the Fantastic. final taking us home. Thanks, everybody. And like I said, we'll keep this live for tomorrow as well. Thanks, Katie. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for um, for participating. So I suppose we'll we'll take uh, take these results, uh, you know, over the next day or so. Um, and, you know, come up with something, uh, you know, interactive again for Thursday. Um, we would like for people, you know, if, if you'd like to talk uh, on, on Thursday, 
we'd like to get a bit of a sample um, of, you know, you know, find, you know, people who want to talk about their five priorities, how you think it links, you know, why you think this is important, why you think it's a national priority. Um, we're also looking for things that nobody else is doing. So things that, you know, the future drought fund can focus on because it's a bit of a gap there. So as you're, um, you know, listening to all these people, having all these great ideas over the next day and a half, it's to, you know, I suppose we're asking you to do some of our work for us here, really, but it's because you guys are on the ground um, that we want to get as much of your uh, input as possible here. And this really is about for us to be able to highlight um, for the department what needs to happen next year, basically. What's the, what are the real, you know, don't like to call them quick wins, but you know what's the what's the what's our first step on the journey to drought resilience there? Um, so if you'd like to talk, uh, we'd love to have um, you know five minutes or so from each of you um, to really be able to get into the detail. I mean we've we've presented here today everything that's been said, but we do want to really think about some of the you know, get into the detail of it a bit. Um, and reflecting on the workshops that we had, um, so much of the really useful discussion happened in those breakout rooms. So we'd like to try and uh, you know, build on that, uh, replicate some of that um, conversation and get people really thinking um, you know, in, in that detailed way. Uh, so I think really that's about it for us. Um, and if you'd like to ask us questions, please feel free. Well, I'm uh, channeling my inner Anthony Green here. I haven't got a, a touch screen, but um, those figures already were hurtling towards 150, but we know because we know these things that there are but double that number at least with us at this moment. So please take time to... Uh, to not so much vote, but put your preferences, your top focus areas, because that's um, what this event is really about, is, is, is getting things into focus. Can I ask a question? Um, when you get the numbers, is it just a numbers game, simple, pure and simple? Or if you've, say, got a, a close run thing between fifth and sixth, you um, think about that as well? I, I think we'd be looking at the numbers, but it's not it's not everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'd uh, we'd be trying to pull out some of the detail, um, definitely. Um, Which is also what we want to tease out a little bit more in that workshop time on Thursday afternoon. And as we mentioned before, a lot of these are quite closely interrelated too. So, um, if there is something that's coming at five or six that's very closely related to two or three, we would be looking at bundling some of these things together and making uh, a different presentation when we're talking back to FDF on what the priorities should probably be. Lovely. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Bill. And keep on bringing your votes in there from all around the country. And it'll be very interesting to see what does come out on top. And as Bill just said, on day three, there will be a Q&A session with Alluvium based partially on what we're doing here now. So share your thoughts in the comments section. They are informing where we go next truly and all your comments are being looked at they're being as they say in the in the trade captured and will be looked at by the department as well as the direct questions you give us thanks very much to bill and katie and to our hubs and michelle it's been a busy afternoon and i think it's time for a cup of tea i don't know if there's any baking going on around the country if there is, we'd love to hear what baking there is. We're going to have a cuppa and a scotch finger, and we're going to come back in 30 minutes for our third and final period of uh, the first day of the Future Drought Fund Science to Practice Forum. We'll see you in 30 minutes.